we start with the painter, Gerard Dahl, who was born in 1455 in what is present day Holland. David gained prominence in 1494, when trade was booming in the Netherlands as it was in Florence, Italy. And people were moving from the countryside to the towns. The arts, of course, flourished, and the municipality of Bruges hired David to create a public work of art based on an account of an ancient Persian judge who was executed for taking a bribe, as recounted by the great Greek historian Herodotus. My research on Gerard Dobby depended in large part on the work of Marianne Ainsworth, curator emerita of European paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of the national uh, esteemed authorities on early Netherlandish art and author of a comprehensive book on Gerard Dobby. Um, I know she's going to be watching this on Zoom, so I wanted to acknowledge her. So according to Herodotus, Cambyses II, king of Persia and conqueror of Egypt during the sixth century BCE or before the Common Era, appointed a man named Sisamnes to sit as a judge of his royal court. During Sisamnes' judicial term, he was accused and arrested for accepting a bribe in exchange for what Herodotus called an unjust judgment. As a result of this judicial misconduct, King Cambyses had Sisamnes flayed, skinned, a lot. Nice, I know. He then had Sisamnes' skin draped across the seat of the judge's bench. No mere suspension or censure for judges then. We thought we had a <laughs> If Blake and Sisamnes weren't bad enough, Cambyses then appointed Sisamnes' son to take his place as judge on the same bench, now draped with his father's skin, to remind him of his father's corruption and dreadful punishment. David painted four scenes on two hinged panels called a diptych. The diptych, dated 1498, was displayed specifically and significantly in the chambers of the aldermen, the functional equivalent of our New York City Council. Today, it hangs in the Groningen Museum in Bruges, Belgium, and it was prominently displayed in the, in the 2008 film In Bruges, starring Colin Farrell. Apart from its grisliness, the diptych typifies justice scenes that decorated municipal buildings in the late Middle Ages. Artists would place justice scenes within religious contexts, such as depicting a celestially throned Jesus judging sinners and criminals. In time, justice scenes became secular, with kings replacing Jesus. You gonna do this, Jim? This is an early example of a secular justice scene, and it's a portion of Androgio Lorenzetti's 1338 three part fresco, The Allegory of Good Government and Bad Government, which remains today in Siena's Palazzo Pubblico or Town Hall. Anybody see it? Yeah, yeah. In English. Local events may have inspired the use of the, third of the theme of the justice of Cambyses for David's commission. In or around 1491, there was a bitter rivalry between German and French factions within Bruges, and an alderman who was allied with the French faction was convicted of and executed for official corruption. He was replaced by a German ally who loudly advocated for the topic of the Justice of Cambyses 
seeking to convey his own integrity as compared to his corrupted French predecessor. Here is the first of the two panels. The story begins in the background of the first panel, showing Judge Kassamis receiving a bride. Back there, you can barely see it, but take my word for it, it's there. In the foreground, King Cambyses arrests Sisamnus and <clears throat> declares the sentence. Urgency in this scene is conveyed by the royal retainer who grasps Sisamnus's arm as he sits on the bench by with the forward motion of the helmeted uh, henchman accompanying King Cambyses and by King Cambyses's own gestures. As you can see, this justice scene is entirely secular. Instead of Christian imagery, David decorated the scene with anti-Roman architectural elements, such as columns and festoons and puti or cherubs. They were all the rage in Renaissance Italy at the time, where ancient Roman sculpture and architecture was regularly unearthed. They would just dig around and things would come up all the time. Now, I'm about to show you the second panel. So if any of you are squeamish, you might want to look on The story continues in the foreground where the flaying is shown in all of its graphic and terrifying details. Sisamnist's grimace reflects the horror and the onlookers seem only mildly uncomfortable as the players perform their bloody task with the clinical focus of surgeons. Ironically, the king, the one who ordered the flame to begin, looks away, perhaps rethinking the exceptionally brutal sentence he has imposed, or perhaps not. And that's the king in his royal urban robes, all this stuff. Herodotus's account ends as shown in the background of the second panel. There, with Sasanus' son sitting on the bench, hearing the case, and you can see his father's skin draped behind him. Of particular interest to me is the bas relief in the first panel right here. Here's a detail on it. The figure on the left tied to his tree is Mar Marcius, a satyr, sometimes depicted as a half goat, half human. Here he's fully human. To his right is the god Apollo, appearing somewhat feminine, but he often did. He was often depicted as feminine. The Roman mythologist Ovid recounted the myth of Apollo and Marcius, an understanding of which, in my view, is essential to gaining a deeper insight into David's diptych and of the justice theme, theme inherent in it. While myths were superseded by Christianity long before the 15th century, they remained useful as they do today in understanding human nature. Here is a summary of the myth. While walking through the woods Phrygia, now modern day Turkey, the satyr Marcius found a flute or pipes that, unbeknownst to him, had been cursed and discarded by the goddess Athena after other goddesses had made fun of the way she looked when she played it. Marcius took the flute, practiced, and became so proud of his flute playing that he challenged Apollo, the master musician of the gods to a musical contest, Marcius with his flute and Apollo with his lyre, you know, one of those tiny harps that cherubs or angels carry. The two agreed that the winner of the contest would choose the punishment for the loser. Apollo, of course, won, for after all, he was God and Marcius was not. To make matters worse, the punishment selected by Apollo was, of course, to have Marcius flayed a lot. Ovid reported, very significantly to me, that as Marcius's skin was stripped from his body, he cried out to Apollo, 
Why do you tear me from myself? Narcissus' blade skin was draped on a tree, and the blood that flowed from it was said to have formed the river of Marcius. Not exactly a fair contest. Absent the flute that had been discarded by the goddess, Marcius may never have challenged the problem. On the other hand, the contest with Marcius's idea. You be the judge, we will discuss it. <laughs> the myth of Apollo and Marcius has been retold over the centuries, often as a warning against hubris, a Greek concept denoting immoderate power, which Marcius certainly displayed when he challenged immortal God. Although the myth plainly serves as a warning against hubris, Embedded within it is an interesting musical image that sheds further light on the deeper meaning of the myth and perhaps on the justice of Cambyses. To the ancient Greeks, stringed instruments like Apollo's lyre represented harmony, law, and order, attributes identified with Apollo, whereas its wind, wind instruments like types or the flute represented chaos, passion, and sensuality, attributes attributed, uh, identified with, with Dionysus or Bacchus, the god of wine and pleasure. As wind instruments were incompatible with the classical love of order, Plato banished them from his Republic, although he expressed an appreciation for the ecstatic states of love and eros. Apparently, Plato had never heard an electric guitar, <laughs> especially one by Jimmy Hen played by Jimmy Hendrix. <laughs> Speaking of electric guitars, 2008 article in the Salt Lake Tribune reported that the Church of Latter-day Saints still regarded guitars as scepters of Satan. <laughs> the basis for the ancient belief that music is cosmic, mathematical, and moral arose from the mathematical theories of Pythagoras and Aristotle's teaching that music imitates emotions and states of the soul with certain kinds of music inspiring nobility and others inspiring baser emotions. With Christianity, however, came a decline in reverence for Greek and Roman classicism. Deemed pagan by the church fathers, music, whether song or performed on wind or stringed instruments was banned entirely. Centuries later, however, in the fifth century CE or common era, Augustine, like Aristotle, recognized the emotional power of music and understood that it was more practical to permit it than exclude it. People do love their music. From unison singing like Gregorian chants, there arose with its pagan flavor, harmonic singing and instrumentation. However, the retelling of the myth of Apollo and Marcius over the centuries reveals that the ancient tension persisted between the orderly Apollonian string instruments and the chaotic Dionysian wind instruments. Here is a visual representation of the myth dating from the fifth century BCE, depicting the musical contest, and it's by the famous Greek sculptor Praxiteles. He shows a comma Apollo with his pretty big lyre, and Marcius passionately playing his flute or pipe. Uh, the central figure, I believe, is a slave or a servant tasked with the ultimate execution of the punishment. Myron, an equally renowned ancient Greek sculptor, depicted here the slave performing, uh, sharpening his knife, about to flay Marcius. The sculpture seems to be very modern in its originality and the psychological depth with which Myron expresses the slave's terror at having to perform the gruesome task. Briefly, <coughs> sobbed, 
during the golden age of classical Greece, when Pythagoras proclaimed that man is the measure of all things, individual artists like Praxiteles and Myron were famous. With the rise of Christianity, however, the individuality of artists was eclipsed by the religious content of their work. Consequently, we know little of medieval artists and architects. With the flower of the Renaissance and the renewed interest in classical values, humans returned with all their glorious individuality to their status as the measure of all things. And in light of the historical perspective gained over the centuries, artists became free to reconsider ancient myths, which were firmly implanted in the collective unconscious of medieval society. In 1483, Pietro Perugino, teacher of the great high Renaissance artist Raphael, presented both Apollo and Marcius in a classically classic Apollonian manner, giving no hint of the contest outcome. Rather, consistent with the Florentine Renaissance style, Perugino focused on the beauty of the figures and the landscape. The myth seems almost incidental. Some 20 years later, Raphael boldly and skillfully merged within a narrow ceiling panel the crowning of yeah. Apollo as winner of the contest, the dread of the slave who is going to play Marcius, and Marcius himself. Raphael's Marcius is a good example of the influence of classical Greek and Roman art and what it had on Renaissance artists. This third century BCE sculpture of the hanging Marcius, or one like it, may have been Raphael's model. Six decades later, the great Phoenician artist Titian depicted the flaying process. Not only is Marcius flayed, but he's flayed upside down. A likely reference to the apostle Bartholomew, who was also flayed upside down. Bartholomew famously appears in Michelangelo's Last Judgment, Sistine Chapel holding his own flayed skin onto which Michelangelo put his own self-portrait. Titian's upside down flame may also represent the martyrdom of the apostle Peter who was crucified upside down or Apollo's ability to play his instrument while holding upside down. In the early 17th century, Bartolomeo Manfredi painted this astoundingly modern Apollo and Marcius, bringing us up close and personal to the psychological drama between the tortured mortal and the tortured god. I think it's really an amazing painting from the early 17th century. According to Ovid, Following the plan of Marcius, the country folk, sylvan deities, fauns, brother satyrs, and nymphs all wept for him. This, this is a scene from just before the plan, lusciously painted in 1879 by John Melkowish Strudling. It typifies the 19th century resurgence of the pastoral style of Raphael's teacher, Perugino. That's why some 19th century artists are known as pre raphaelite Here, Marcius stands by the river, which will soon be named for him, as Apollo pronounces his terrible sentence. Marcius is depicted as human and not at all goat-like. Apparently, he gained a measure of stature during the liberal and romantic 19th century. In 2002, the myth was entirely abstracted by sculptor Anish Kapoor in a monumental installation, Marcius, at the Tate Modern in London. It comprises, you couldn't, couldn't fit it all in one here, but there are three steel rings 
joined together by a span of red plastic, which is, of course, intended to depict uh, the red, a bloody stretching of the skin. In an interview, Kapoor referenced the myth as a warning that artists dare not create a work more beautiful than the gods could create. A word about flame. It has been said that skin is the parchment on which identity is written. Hence, Marcy's cried out, why do you tear me? Flame was a subject of interest during the Renaissance when anatomy was an emerging science. In 1543, Andreas Salius laid cadavers to produce his rendering of musculature, doubtlessly influenced by Leonardo and Michelangelo. It's easy to compare David's depiction of the flame of Sassamus with Rembrandt's anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tuch from 1632. Like the cadaver in Rembrandt's painting, Sassamnus's body is laid out, surrounded by professionals. A similar scene appears in the reward of cruelty, William Hogarth's fourth and final engraving of the four stages of cruelty, dated 1791. This engraving presents the vivid section for a live dissection of a convicted murderer who, like Sassamis, is laid out on a table. The execution is also presided over by an authority figure, either a judge or a chief surgeon, don't know which. And around the table are witnesses who take in the spectacle with neither outrage nor disgust. In my possibly unoriginal view, aspects of the diptych suggest that Sassamis was as much a martyr as a criminal. The piece of cotton as his head could represent a crown of thorns or even a halo. And he not only endures his agony with a martyr's courage, but he's laid out like Lawrence the martyr who was laid out over a bed of hot coals and burned alive. And this execution is not being conducted within some mythical Renaissance landscape or against an abstract background, but smack dab in the middle of town, surrounded by colleagues among whom the king appears without fanfare. There is nothing mythic or remote in this immediate and terrifying punishment of a judge. Many questions are raised. And I can't answer them, but we can discuss them later, if you want. Was the diptych intended not only to glorify the new German allied aldermen, but to warn judges that judicial misconduct could warrant torture and execution? Does its excessive ghastliness suggest that the punishment is wildly disproportionate to the misconduct? Mm -hmm. Was that David's intention? Was the classical preference for law and order over anarchy the actual message? I also wonder whether the incorporation of the myth within the diptych was David's idea, and whether it reflects the notion that judges may be as easily influenced by the stature of a litigant as bribery. And would Sassanus have been played? Had he issued an unjust judgment in favor of a royal relative? But why depict a judge being flayed for corruption when it was a politician who was executed for it? Did 15th century Netherlandish society conflate the judiciary with politics? Now that would be unusual. According to one legal scholar, the diptych demonstrates that judges who are appointed by authoritarians are subject to the most terrible of punishments, whereas those appointed according to democratic principles, like us, are specially situated employees who, while paid by the state, are protected by the state's ordinary exercise of authority. 
one specially situated employee who was not insulated from the state's ordinary exercise authority was none other than the father of Judge Benjamin N. Cardozo. <laughs> judge Benjamin Cardozo served, as you know, as chief judge of our highest state court, the New York Court of Appeals. And from that court, he was appointed to the US Supreme Court. Judge Cardozo was well known for his devotion to the rule of law, disciplined indifference to the status of litigants as the Thomas Brown, and concern with the abstract legal authorities underlying the case. Cardozo's father, Albert, was also a judge, but his career ended when he was forced to resign from the New York State Supreme Court, the court in which I served. He had been recommended for impeachment by a legislative committee on the accusation that he had been influenced in his rulings by the robber baron Jay Gould. The younger Cardozo has thus been called a son of Sisamis, mm -hmm. as he studiously blinded himself to the status of the litigant before, unlike his disgraced father. I close with this. Although some consider evolution a myth, myths evolve like people do. And those who dismiss evolution as a myth fail to acknowledge that the gods they worship may be as cruel as the humans who worship. And while capital punishment may have evolved from brutal practices like flame, hopefully it will further evolve into extinction along the arc, arc of the moral universe that bends toward justice. Thank you.